one keynote to another keynote, and I'm excited to, uh, to bring Bill Ammerman to you. Um, I wanted to mention also, this is a crazy time for us because normally we would do all this in one studio. Um, and of course, we are also split up. This, th what you're seeing from me is, is going through basically three different places before it gets to you uh, in three different total cities because we are also spread out just like you are. So uh, this is a little bit uh, tougher feat than we ever could have imagined this would be. Uh, but I want to bring on uh, Bill Ammerman. Um, this is, you know, this is our beta a uh, year, first first uh, launch event. Not, not everything's going to go perfect. We saw half of Bill a second ago. Now we got all of Bill. Bill is an award-winning author of a book, The Invisible Brand. Now, many of you know that I teach at the University of North Carolina. I teach advertising and branding. And I happened to be reading his book on an airplane. And, uh, and I was like, this is a perfect book for my students. So I then required my students the next two semesters to read his book. It just won the 2019 uh, Marketing and Sales Book of the Year Award. Um, he has over 20 years of experience of executive leadership in digital advertising, and he's passionate about marketing in the age of artificial intelligence. And our industry is moving quickly towards AI and voice. And uh, Bill, first off, thank you for your book. My students loved your book. You were kind enough to come speak to my class in person. So I begged you to come and be our key second keynote speaker for Pro AV Day. So first, welcome to our uh, launch platform. Thanks, Gary. It's great to be here. Well, Bill, Bill, you're going to really enjoy Bill. Uh, Bill's going to talk about AI, AR, and uh, voice and how it's going to impact our industry. Bill, so I'm going to turn it over to you. Thanks. Um, I'm going to start with a proposition that will uh, be meaningful to you now and into the future, and that is artificial intelligence is already at work changing you. And I'm going to present for about 30 minutes to try to convince you of specifically how it's already at work and what you should be thinking about in terms of uh, how to embrace it and how to get the most out of it. So let's start with uh, some basic propositions about the world of marketing powered by artificial intelligence. So the first is the personalization of information. The information that you receive from the web has been personalized to you. Second, persuasion has become a science. It's no longer a matter of putting our finger in the wind and guessing. We actually use technology to figure out what persuades you, what information, what uh, technology is the most persuasive, and that is changing the way we deliver marketing messages. The third is that machines now learn, and they learn to persuade you using your personalized information. And the fourth is we're now using natural language processing, which enables us to actually talk to machines that are learning to persuade us using our personalized information. Let's go through those one at a time. The World Wide Web transformed mass media. When I was a kid, we all got the same uh, six o'clock evening news. We read the same version of the news from the newspaper, uh, but we have moved into an age where information can be delivered to you, just to you in a very highly personalized fashion that I call mass customization. So we've moved from mass communication to mass customization and we customize information to you based on what we know about you, what you like, where you go, both on the web and in the real world, and who you know. And that personalization allows us to deliver information that you are more likely to consume and which can, in fact, be more persuasive to you when you're exposed to marketing messages. Number two, we're looking at the science of persuasion. Media algorithms reward us by telling us what we want to hear. In this illustration, I've got this little Facebook thumbs up and you know, you get this little message or you might get a, a, you know, a, a number one or a number two on your uh, social media post that indicate that someone somewhere has liked or commented on your feed. That triggers a little drip of dopamine in your brain and it leaves you laying in a puddle of hearts like this little girl you know, enjoying the fact that someone out there loves me. Well, the media algorithms that are at work today are very good at figuring out 
what keeps you coming back and what gets you excited and how we can actually deliver information that keeps you addicted to your cell phone. The next slide is really a simple illustration that you know machine learning has taken algorithms from being prediction tools you know a prediction tool you might think of as putting little plots on a graph and drawing a line of best fit and figuring that the next point on that graph is going to be somewhere uh, along that line of best fit that's prediction but machine learning enables us to think about how we can actually bend that line towards our key performance indicators how we can prescriptively change the outcomes? How can we actually change behaviors? And that's where machine learning is different than purely uh, statistical prediction. We're no longer predicting, we're prescribing. We're changing the outcomes, we're bending the curve. And finally, natural language processing. We're talking to these machines and these devices have become per pervasive in our lives. With the internet of things, devices, it can be anything from a, a speaker in your kitchen to the phone that you carry, to the earbuds that you wear, to the television, to your car. We're now talking to our devices and increasingly the conversations we're having will open us up to a level of persuasion that is unlike anything that has gone before. So let's kind of dive in a little bit to understand the growth of voice assistance. First of all, voice assistance grew astronomically over the past five years, and that is projected to grow to 20, by 2023 to upwards of 8 billion voice assistants in use. Now that you know, translates to one per person across the planet. But realistically, there are people in the planet that don't have voice assistance. That means that, you know, for those of you who live in uh, the more developed, advanced parts of the world, you're going to have four or five voice assistants that you're going to be interacting with on a routine basis. And I want you to make this correlation. If you take the top most valuable global brands, Apple, Google, Amazon, Microsoft, they might change pole position a little bit, you know, now and then, but those are still the leading four. That corresponds with the four voice ecosystems that are the most popular, Apple, Google, Amazon, and Microsoft. Apple's got Siri, Google's got the Google Assistant, Amazon's got Alexa, Microsoft's got Cortana. The world's most valuable brands are already building voice ecosystems that people are interacting with. And that's a key takeaway for today. The voice user interface is the consumer facing edge of artificial intelligence at the world's most valuable brands. If you remember nothing else from today's presentation, I want you to remember that. These voice ecosystems that are being built by the world's most valuable brands are going to be a permanent part of the marketing future. They're a permanent part of your life. And businesses are going to either have to build their own ecosystems or they're going to have to play in the sandbox of these major brands that have already started building these voice ecosystems. Now let's talk about how this technology hacks our empathy and it operates on us psychologically. I'm going to tell you a, a, a story from my own personal experience. I was uh, invited to my next door neighbor's house. Um, I was having cocktails on their patio overlooking their beautiful pool and I was quite comfortable and their four-year-old son came and tugged on my sleeve and wanted me to go with him to show me something. And I was very reluctant. I, I, I was comfortable. I was happy where I was. And I was worried I was getting lured into a game of Candyland um, when his mother kind of reassuringly gave me a nod and suggested, yeah, you know, go with him, you know, see what he's got. So I followed him into the kitchen and there on the counter was Alexa. And the little boy, you know, barely could see over the edge of the counter. He put his hands on the, on the edges of the counter and stood on his tippy toes. And he said, Alexa, play Star Wars. 
and Alexa played the theme from Star Wars, you know, John Williams, 1977, Star Wars, done, and I played the theme, and he was elated. And that lasted for about 10 seconds before he was on to the next thing. And I was watching this interaction, and I was thinking, you know, this is really interesting. This, this four-year-old can't read, uh, he can't use a, a graphical user interface, but he can navigate a voice user interface seamlessly. And that led me to an important conclusion that, you know, we use voice earlier in life. We develop speech when we're about one, one and a half years old. We don't develop reading skills until we're four, five, six years old. And, and so this technology is tapping into something, you know, deeper in our brainstem. And as I was having that mental conversation, the most, you know, un, I was completely unprepared when the little boy leaned towards the Alexa and he said, Alexa, I love you. <laughs> and all of my mental conversation was arrested at that moment. Everything came to a screeching halt. This four-year-old boy had innocently professed his love to an inanimate object, uh, a device that was talking to him in this, you know, female voice. And, and as I was standing there, I noticed that his mother had walked into the kitchen and was kind of watching this whole interplay. And I caught this kind of pained, almost jealous look on her face. And she turned quickly and marched out of the room. And I was left standing there pondering the significance that a child could profess his love for a disembodied voice. And I want to emphasize that I'm not the first to draw that connection. Uh, in 1996, Byron Reeves and Clifford Nass wrote the media equation in which they theorized that people can relate to computers just like they do real people. And more recently, last year, uh, a study was done by a German scientist in which they actually sat people down with this little robot named Neo, and they told the, the study participants to interact with NAO, and they did. And at the end of the, uh, of the study, they told the participants, okay, now reach over and turn NAO off. Now in the control group, they just reached over and turned the little robot off. But in the study group, the robot protested and said, please don't turn me off. I'm scared of the dark. And a full 30% of the study group refused to turn the robot off. Why? Because we were all scared of the dark when we were five. And they had been interacting with this device using voice. And they empathetically believed that this device could be scared of the dark. And they didn't want to make it, you know, scared. And so they refused to turn the device off. That's remarkable because it illustrates something that is, you know, fundamental to the idea that we become more vulnerable, we become open to persuasion when we talk to our technology. And I call that psychological technology or even psychotechnology. So we're now in the age of psychotechnology. We are talking to machines that learn to persuade us using our personalized information. Here's a prediction for you. In the next three years, voice commerce will grow to be an $80 billion industry from you know, zero to $80 billion in six, seven years. That's pretty extraordinary. And the rate of growth is uh, astronomical. And for you to start thinking about this, I just want to give you some quick stat statistics. 90 million US adults use voice assistance on a monthly basis. And Apple Siri dominates the market on the uh, on the mobile device, 44% of people use it that way. And in terms of a use case, driving a car leads by 62%. And I, I would say that um, driving a car is an obvious example because it's hands-free, you can use voice, you can ask for directions, and it's a, it's a simple use case, but it's getting more sophisticated. And um, when we think about 
uh, these use cases and people using the technology, you have to start realizing that as brand leaders, as marketers, and as AV professionals, you have to be an early adopter in this technology. Gartner has predicted that by next year, people who have made the investment to redesign their digital presence to enable voice, to support voice, will see a 30% increase in revenues over what over you know the alternative if they hadn't made that investment and that's a pretty strong prediction and Gartner's a you know a pretty uh, reliable organization so I encourage you to think about where voice plays a role in your business and I would encourage you to break the problem down into these four stages first I want you to understand your customers use of voice I want you to second understand the devices they use Third, I want you to learn the differences between the voice assistants. I want you to be more discerning, more sophisticated about not just one idea of voice, but that there are different ecosystems within the world of voice user interfaces. And last, I want you to think about whether your services are ready for voice. So let's break those down. Here's a quick visual to help you think about that. You've got your consumers, they're interacting with devices. Those devices, again, uh, I'm defining that as the TV, the, 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 you know, the smart speaker, the automobile, the earbuds, the voice assistants themselves, which are not necessarily connected to the devices. In some cases, like uh, you know, an Amazon Echo, you have a dedicated voice assistant connected to the device. But in other cases, manufacturers are building devices that are agnostic and can use different voice assistants depending on the user's preference. And then finally, there's the connection between your business and those uh, voice ecosystems. Let's take those one at a time. One, understand your, your customer's use of voice. Here's just a quick psychographic. They tend to be male. They tend to be early adopters, 18 to 29 years old. They tend, you know, the most common use case is while driving. Apple Siri is the most popular mobile interface. Uh, they're using it for general search. They're using it to get directions. They're using it to find a restaurant. What's the nearest Thai restaurant near me? One in five consumers have actually spent money using voice. We can spend money faster with our mouths than with our fingers. That's an extraordinary fact. And when we look at this, household items, entertainment, music, movies, apparel, games, you know, my kids are sitting at home cocooning in the uh, age of COVID. And what are they doing? They're talking to the TV. They're saying, you know, play this, play that. They're, they're, they're buying, they're consuming media with their voice. They're just sitting in my living room talking to the television because who wants to have to type in all of those letters to find, you know, the TV show you want to find among the 500 channels and the 20 apps that are installed on your TV. You just hold the little button down and speak into it and it finds what you're looking for. Um, my children are way ahead of the curve in terms of using voice technology uh, than I am or, or, you know, my generation. And then Step two, I want you to understand that the devices people use have a, a specific meaning. Are they mobile? Is it somebody that's locked down to a home theater system in their living room? If you're in your car driving, you might be using voice technology to ask for and to deliver different uh, user experiences than you are in your living room. People have customized voice interfaces based on the device. If you're on a, a laptop and you're making airline, you're, you're going to an airline website, you might be looking for making reservations for the future. If you're on your mobile device and you're standing in the airport, you're probably wanting to check into your flight or check a flight status. Those are different user experiences and the devices themselves tell us something about how the individual is expecting to receive information, what they might be seeking, what kinds of information, what kind of interface, what kind of a user experience uh, they want. So think about the devices and think about how that changes based on the consumer's uh, desired uh, outcome, what they're looking for. Cars are a voice-enabled device. And I think it's really telling 
that car manufacturers are starting to advertise that the automobile is voice enabled. You know, uh, Mercedes comes to mind. They've got their, you know, Ask Mercedes or Hey Mercedes TV campaign. When you think about the fact that we've gone from a society that was obsessed with, you know, wheelbase and zero to 60 in six seconds and, you know, X number of cubic inches, you think about what used to sell a car. And today, We've now thrown all of that in the scrap heap of history, and we're selling cars based on whether they can talk. We don't care how fast it is. We don't care how, you know, we're not looking for muscle cars. We're looking for cars that interface with our mobile devices and that we can talk to. And that has become an, empo an empowering sales feature of the automobile for car dealers. Amazing. Something can similarly be said about televisions. Your next smart speaker will be your TV. I spoke at NAB, the National Association of Broadcasters, this past year, and I was amazed at how many people came up to me after I spoke and wanted to learn more about how televisions are becoming a bottom of the sales pyramid or bottom of the marketing pyramid technology. We used to think of the television as top of the pyramid. It was planting the seeds. It was used to advertise. Now, the television as a smart speaker can be used to actually make purchases. That really changes the dynamic of how we view this technology that's hanging on the wall in every American living room. It's gone from being an advertising medium to being one that's actually connected to the cash register. And that's very different. And I want... I want people to start thinking about how that changes how we use this technology. All right, learn the differences between the assistants. I won't read all of this in detail, but Apple Siri is the dominant mobile interface. It works on Apple devices, including Apple TV and AirPods. It uses Google for search. And if you think about the differences between those technologies, you also start to realize that voice search is not text search voice tends to flatten search. It tends to give you just one result. And as you start to think about the differences between all of, the, all of those uh, ecosystems, also understand that the user experience of voice is unlike the user experience of a graphical user interface. No longer are you given 60 options or five pages of Google results, you're just given one. And oftentimes those results are being pulled from the Google featured snippet. In this example, I've got uh, Grand Central Terminal. And you know, when I asked Siri, um, what is Grand Central Station? It responds with the details from this Grand Central Terminal uh, Google featured snippet. It actually read it verbatim to me. I want you to start thinking about harnessing the power of near me. People consume new, you know, voice based on searching for products. And that's very, very common. Uh, you know, where's the local restaurant? Where can I buy this product? And finding products near you is a common use case. So think about this as a proximity-based technology. And finally, think about how your brand interfaces with these voice ecosystems. There's now 100,000 Alexa skills and growing every day. Voice assistants are evolving and Siri uses shortcuts, Google uses actions, Alexa uses skills to enable voice commerce. Your business, you need to be thinking about how you can be found and uh, how you can you know, conduct business using voice. Recommendation engines are a powerful example of this. Um, you know, Alexa's algorithm works through a, a very defined tree. It looks for products with the Amazon's, uh, the Amazon badge. It looks for products that are available for prime delivery. It looks for products from the user's purchase history. And if you can't find any of those, it defaults to the first product in the Bing search. So start to think, you know, in a more serious fashion about how the technology works and how you can use it. And at the point where you've kind of gotten a hold of the technology and you've started to really dive in and understand it, make sure that your products are ready for voice. And I encourage you to play with this. Go today. Try to find yourself using voice. Try to learn about your products using voice. And if you're really good, try to actually buy your services 
using voice and see what the results are. You may be disappointed, but that's an opportunity to start thinking, okay, here's something that I need to embrace. Um, I'm going to give you a couple examples. I, I mentioned this a minute ago, uh, but the Her Hey Mercedes campaign. Mer Mercedes ran a one-minute ad during the Super Bowl that highlighted their voice control system. Again, I, I just find that amazing to think we've gone from selling cars based on you know the sex appeal of you know how fast they go to I can talk to it. I can talk to my car. That's a feature that's selling cars, and it's a competitive edge for car manufacturers that have embraced the voice user interface over car manufacturers that are lagging behind. Hey, Bill, Walk I have a question for you, Bill. Yeah, yeah. Uh, related to our industry, uh, Todd asks, uh, when, when do you think that voice will be used as the main connection to AV systems? Right now, we have connections that are like push buttons and touch panels but at what point in time do you see voice as being the primary connection point to interface the system, thus simplifying a classroom or a meeting room? Well, I, I think that, you know, I can only give examples of things that are already happening. But, you know, when I attended CES last year, uh, the Consumer Electronics Show, when, when you looked at AV systems, particularly Samsung systems, every technology that they were rolling out was voice enabled. They've got a, a their own proprietary ecosystem called Bixby. Uh, but the Bixby system was being rolled out as kind of a, a, a fundamental AV technology, this voice control for uh, Samsung consumer electronics. Now, you know, for professional AV systems, because they're a little more uh, uh, narrow in terms of the, you know, they're they're a B2B product rather than B2C. There may be a lagging indicator, but I would say, you know, you're you're on top of a transition that's going to be happening over the next several years. Uh, I can't predict specifically, but, you know, Consumer Electronics Show being a leading indicator, I would say, you know, these technologies are being embedded into this tech, into uh, consumer technology already. Uh, I can only imagine that professional technology will be uh, you know, close at hand. And already we're using voice control over Internet of Things uh, devices uh, in lots of, you know, areas, including agriculture. We're, we're embedding chips into cows to track them in the pasture, and we're using voice technology to analyze the analytics of where dairy cows are feeding. You know, that, that should just kind of, uh, you know, set your mind on fire when you think that we're, you know, transforming dairy cows with the internet of things and voice technology. Here's an example on the screen for Sephora. Sephora's voice interface allows people from their homes to determine their skin type, get skincare tips, and even book beauty sessions and buy products. Um, another example, Domino's uh, partnered with uh, Samsung smart TVs and Amazon Alexa and Google Home and, and the Domino's app, and you can use voice to order a pizza from your television. So you're sitting watching the game and you can literally order a Domino's pizza and have it show up in 15 minutes, all from your TV. You never have to get off the couch other than to go get the pizza from the front door. Um, and then finally, a great example, recent example, TD Ameritrade has started allowing trading, stock trading, um, using voice. They can deliver live streams of news and information, investor research. You can actually talk to your car and you can be driving to work and be getting portfolio updates about your uh, the performance of your investments. You can get stock quotes and you can also trade through voice technology. And uh, you, they're already trading using voice on Alexa. And uh, the next step that they've announced is that they're going to introduce uh, stock trading from your car. They're working on a couple of security uh, issues there, but um, it's, it's really extraordinary how much technology is being enabled by voice and how consumers are increasingly adopting voice because it's easy. You don't have to type. You say, hey, play The Bachelor and the TV finds The Bachelor among you know, 500 channels. So I'll conclude with this question. Does your brand talk? Are you able to talk to your technology? And if not today, 
that's coming very soon. And I want you to start thinking about how you can prepare for that point. And I'll, I'll refrain back to my, uh, my proposition. Artificial intelligence is already at work changing you. You are already being influenced by AI through your technology. You're starting to talk to your technology and the technology that you're talking to is designed to learn about you. It's designed to learn about you and learn how to persuade you using personalized information. And that's going to open up a new opportunity for us to have this kind of voice-based relationship with machines that can solve problems for us. And um, as an industry, you need to be thinking about where that enters your business and what it means for your consumers and how you uh, deliver entertainment, connectivity, and uh, you know how it makes money for you and, and your companies. And this is a great session. And we have a couple of questions that, that have come in. Um, when, uh, when, when, can the, when do we remove the computer and the computer becomes like it was in Star Trek and ultimately uh, you know, a device that you're always holding in your hand? I mean, the, the mobile phone, as you know, it, that we have now is more powerful than the laptops we had 10 or 12 years ago. At what point in time do we even don't need the interface of the traditional laptop or desktop computer? Lydia asked at what point in time is it become this is the computer and that you're really just communicating with it. And I guess that would lead to a discussion on neuro networking, which we probably don't have time to get into because we only have a couple minutes here. But what do you think? Can you, can you answer that in 30 seconds? Well, you know, we're already wearing technology. So uh, wearable technology, uh, watches, earbuds, necklaces. Um, you know, there's, this technology has already become something that is embedded into devices that are so small that we wear them in our ears and we don't think about them as you know high technology but really you put in a pair of earbuds that's connected to the internet and these little earbuds have tremendous capability to deliver information it's an interface that you're just talking to so the voice user interface is going to be pervasive and it's already here so that the answer is now yeah and the, one of the questions that David brought up was security. Um, and uh, my, I look at this as similar to the situation we had 15, 12 or 15 years ago with the iPhone, when everybody, all the IT departments were resisting bringing the iPhone into the company, but the CEOs, CIOs, the CTOs, the presidents of the companies demanded it, the C-suite ex demanded it, and they had to find a way to adapt it. But it took Apple a couple of generations to sort of patch the security issues at, you know, if you, 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 most people can't just take an Alexa and stick it in a classroom today because it becomes a security hole. At what point in time will these consumer devices, do you believe, start playing in the commercial side of the market with, with regard to voice? Well, I think, uh, you know, security is kind of the key issue there. Um, when we think about security, we have to understand that there's this trade off between um, the uh, value that we can create with uh, consumers and, and with our brands and on the other side, the security hole. I give the example frequently, and I may have in your class, Gary, um, of uh, a pet boarding uh, business, or you take your pets when you're going on vacation, they require certain information from you. And we openly give that information, you know, where am I going to be? How can I be reached? When will I be back? That pet boarding business has a right to and a transparent transaction with us to enable the safety of our pet while we're gone. What we don't want is for that same company to let you know bad actors know that we're going to be out of town so they can rob our house, right? That, I'm being a little metaphorical here, but think about security as that misuse of information that can be gained through the technology. And sometimes we have to realize that the same information that we you know, give to businesses and that they have a right to use for good purposes can also be used for nefarious and bad purposes. And that's where it becomes very difficult as a security problem to say, okay, this information by itself is neither, you know, good nor bad. It's the use by the uh, recipient of that information, how they use that information um, makes it 
good or bad. And that becomes very difficult to regulate. So I think we're going to still struggle with this issue for a long time. I don't think this is something that we're going to fix in, you know, 18 months. I think we're going to be struggling with security issues in 18 years. Uh, but I would also say that's not something that should preclude you from trying to figure out how to make money with it and how to do business with consumers. Uh, the security problems aren't going to go away. I like to say, you know, we build a 10 foot ladder and the bad guy, you know, we build a 10 foot wall and the bad guys build an 11 foot ladder and that <laughs> process continues. Um, but that, that shouldn't stop you from getting involved because the consumers and the, the technology are already racing far ahead. Bill, I really appreciate you doing this for me today. I really appreciate you being here. Uh, it's an honor to speak to you again. I love your book. I've recommended it to hundreds of people. I know that uh, you had a couple of hundred of them purchased by students. So uh, thank you very much for joining us today.